Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tomas Masio Broda. Thank you. So, so welcome to my talk about some algorithmic foundations of peer-to-peer -peer and wireless networks. Uh, before starting with the talk, however, I'd like to thank you very much for actually inviting me here to uh, Microsoft Research, to Redmond, and for giving me the opportunity to present myself and also some of my research here at uh, MSR. It's really a great honor and a great pleasure to be here today. Also, I would like to thank you for the uh, wonderful gift basket I received in my hotel. This was really a great surprise and a happy one, too. So thank you very much. So during my two years doing a PhD, I've been working on various uh, areas, um, but all of them are kind of related to large-scale and highly decentralized networks. So I've been done work on scheduling in wireless networks, also localization, then more focused on sensor networks. Then uh, more recently, I've done also work in, uh, about internet and peer-to-peer -peer networks. And finally, a large part of my thesis is about theory, in particular about distributed computing theory, so distributed approximation and hardness of distributed approximation. Today, however, I would like to um, focus on two um, topics. First, about scheduling in wireless networks. This is going to be the first, say, two-third of my talk. And then afterwards, I would like to talk about um, the interplay of selfishness and maliciousness in, uh, in the Internet and peer-to-peer -peer networks. This is going to be the last part of my talk. And at the very end, I would like to spend one or two minutes to kind of fill in this uh, slide, kind of fill in my remaining work into this slide here, so that you can make yourself a more complete picture of, of uh, who I am. So. Uh, the first part is going to be about scheduling in wireless networks. And as you will know, um, well, scheduling in wireless networks is a crucial thing. And because of interference, uh, this scheduling is somewhat more complex than in, say, wired networks. And of course, there exists a lot of existing work uh, about this topic. But nonetheless, let me start with a maybe somewhat provocative question right at the beginning. And I ask, so are the foundations, are the kind of possibilities and limitations of MacLayer protocols really understood? And in particular, are the currently employed protocols, so MacLayer protocols, scheduling protocols, do they really achieve a performance which is kind of uh, close to what can actually be achieved? So is it kind of competitive in this sense? And in order to study this, let's look at the possibly the simplest possible scheduling problem you can imagine. And this is just the following. So you have a network consisting of, say, n nodes in Euclidean plane, for instance. And we just want to answer the question, how many time slots or how much time do you need until every node can transmit one message? And we're not saying to which other node. So you can choose the receivers freely, optimally. So for instance, every node can transmit to its closest neighbor. So all we want to know is how many time slots do you need until every node can, say, for instance, transmit its identifier to the outside world. And we call this the scheduling complexity in wireless networks. And notice that this scheduling problem is somehow so simple, it is somehow fundamental in the sense that if you have a MacLayer protocol, which is not good for this simple problem, of course, it cannot be good for any kind of real-world problem where you have like routing requirements or traffic patterns or anything like that. So here, you just really want to say, how much time do you need until every node can transmit once? So to make this more clear, so we have this network here, for instance. So how many time slots do you need? Uh, in, say, in the first time slot, say, node 1, 4, and 7 can transmit simultaneously. This works. The messages arrive. Then in the second time slot, 2, 3, and 6 can, for instance, be scheduled at the same time. And finally, in the third time slot, 5 and 8. And now everyone has transmitted one's message, one message. We required three time slots. So the scheduling complexity of this network is three. Yeah? So this is going to be the next slide, actually. 
So yeah, so what? But this is just a. Um, no Sorry. Yeah, if if there was no interference, it would take like two time slots. So what? What this is just uh, the next slide will will give you the model. This is just saying that you know, intuitively, these two links can be scheduled uh, with with in a reasonable interference mode. So, just what I want to stress at the moment is that. And what we're interested in is what is kind of the scheduling complexity as a function of n. If n is the number of nodes. How, how does this time you need until you can schedule all nodes at least once increase as a function of n? So here we go. Here is this uh, interference model that we assume. This is the classic so-called physical model. I don't know. Many of you will maybe know this. Um, this is based on the so-called signal-to-noise plus interference or in short for SINR ratio. And the idea is here that a message is successfully decoded if the ratio between the received signal power divided by the noise plus the total interference, and interference is just the sum of the powers received by all simultaneously transmitting nodes. Uh, if this ratio is larger than some constant beta, in practice this beta is a very small constant, three or four or something like this. And now we have another parameter in this formula, and this is the parameter alpha here. This is the path, so-called path loss exponent. And this path loss exponent says, okay, if I am a sender and I transmit at a certain power, how does this power decay as a function of the distance? So this, this path loss exponent is typically a value between two and six, depending on the whether there's a wall in between or what kind of medium you have. So this is the classic so-called physical model of wireless communication. Now there exists a lot of related work about this model, about scheduling, about interference, and so on. But a close inspection of all these uh, works kind of indicate that none of these um, works really answer our questions. None of these works really tell us, OK, what is the scheduling complexity in wireless networks? And in particular, none of them really tell us how good are currently used protocols in this sense. Are they kind of close to what can be achieved, or are they much, much worse? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, what many of these related works study is kind of the impact of interference on so-called the capacity. The capacity is how much information can be transmitted in a network. Um, however, most of these related works does not give you really a, um, say, a protocol or algorithmic way uh, of, of solving these problems. But instead, many of these studies kind of give, uh, for instance, some, somehow mathematical uh, program formulations, which cannot be solved in P, but uh, which kind of just uh, indicate what is the maximum amount of capacity you can transmit and so on. But, um, so this is uh, what is done. But it, none of them really says, okay, currently used protocols are kind of competitive or not competitive. And this is why we study this scheduling complexity, which is kind of a very simple problem, which gives us a handle to really understand the performance of currently used protocols. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not considering graphs uh, because this physical model is actually that's going to be one of my points. It's very different from graphs actually, and this, the, the point about worst case is a very good point. So this is really kind of you could say that many of these works use means of simulation, like randomly distributed uh, networks, for example, and then they use simulation to show okay how much capacity can you in such networks. Now we take a more worst case oriented approach in the sense that we uh, that I really want to understand, okay, in, in, in a worst case network, what is the competitive ratio of these people? Such problems? Yes.
Yes. Yeah. Now it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I can answer in this sense that now if we are studying, uh, it turns out that um, choosing an appropriate receiver is actually very simple in our setting because we're talking about Euclidean space. So what you can say is that just everyone, for instance, sends to its closest neighbor, and this gives you a constant. Uh, like this can be almost only a factor of say five or six worse than an optimal. But within constant uh, factors, this is all the same. Then, so if everyone chooses its closest neighbor. Now, um, another point is that if you have like arbitrary requests, so for example, if, if it is already decided what uh, your receiver will be, this is uh, part of our other work, which I'm not going to talk about, but we have also studied this. So I would like now to Add, before actually answering this question, I would like to add a very brief uh, inter, uh, intermezzo and kind of highlight what is actually the, the difficulty of the problems we are studying or what is the intuition behind them. So consider this very simple uh, uh, example with four nodes, A wants to transmit to B and C to D. And the question is, can this be done simultaneously? Can this be done in parallel? And well, intuitively, one might think that this is not possible because you know this is the classic hidden terminal problem. If C transmits to D, then there is a collision at B. So this is kind of what might expect at first. But in fact, it is no problem that these transmissions can be done in parallel. The point is, if you set the transmission powers to appropriate levels, so say if the transmission power at A is set to a higher level than the one at C, you can plug in these values. I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can plug in these values. And you see that the SI and R at B and D is perfectly uh, enough for both messages to be decoded. And therefore, in this example here, for instance, simultaneous transmission is easily possible. Now, notice that, for example, all currently used Mac layer protocols I am aware of, for example, ADO. 802.11, for instance, they will not schedule these links in parallel because, uh, because of this hidden terminal problem. So only one of them is scheduled at the same time, but it could be done with a proper power assignment policy. It could be done in parallel. Now let's make it tougher, and let's look at this example here. We have A wants to transmit to B, and C wants to transmit to D, and I again ask, can this be done in parallel? And well, I would not ask if it could not be done. So again, if you set the, the powers at A and C, at the senders, to the appropriate levels, then again, you can compute the SI and Rs at the receivers, and both of them can decode the message uh, perfectly well. So again, even in this case, even though it seems that D is kind of within the transmission range of node A, it can decode, it, it can receive a message. And this is somehow regarding your question about graph models and so on. This kind of really shows a difference between graph, any kind of graph model where you have conflict graphs or interference range is higher than transmission range or whatever you want. This is not modeled in such models. And this, of course, also makes it tough from an algorithmic point of view. So how can you use this for protocols? So let's go back to this scheduling problem. So again, we have n nodes in the Euclidean plane. Every node can choose its power level. And a message is received if the SINR is sufficiently high. And we want the scheduling complexity of these wireless networks is the minimum number of time slots required until every node can say, just transmit its identifier to some other node. What is clear is that this is at most n. Because what you can always do is just take one node, and then the next, and then the next. And just, so this is a trivial upper bound, but uh, this also be, seems to be a bad upper bound. Now, I, I come back to your point. Now, if we study this problem in a different model, in a, say, simplistic model, in a graph model, for instance, the problem would become easy because we could do say, coloring in the, in the Euclidean plane. This can be done. Uh, or if we assume that kind of powers are fixed already, then also 
there, there, is, there is much more you can do. But as we have seen in this um, example with just four nodes, kind of assuming that powers are fixed or assuming that we have a graph model kind of already limits the performance drastically. Right? So if we really want to understand whether currently employed protocols are kind of good or not, we, we need to study this model here where nodes can choose their powers freely. So when I started studying this problem, I thought that, you know, kind of a protocol like uh, 802.11 or so should be kind of close to, uh, close to optimal in the sense that it should not be too, too much worse than, than the achievable. And so what are currently used and studied uh, power assignment policies? Well, the simplest one is you have uniform power. Everyone sends it with the same uh, power. A second one is what I call a so-called linear power assignment. Now, what does this mean? Um, if I'm a sender and I want to transmit to someone at distance d, then the minimum power I need to do that is d to the power of alpha. Right? Because this is the case. Now, any protocol which kind of sets the transmission power to, say, a constant times d to the power of alpha, this constant is used because maybe you have some interference, so you want to transmit a little bit more. This is what I call a linear power assignment because it is linear relative to this minimum you have to do. And there are other power schemes, say you have a discrete set of power levels or the, the power is just some kind of function of the length, the link and so on. And the question is how good are these power assignment policies? So if we are lucky, then we could show that they are good, and this would serve as a major justification of using these policies. However, if we are unlucky somehow, then it could turn out that the scheduling complexity and the performance of such kind of power assignment policies is very bad. And this would mean that if we want to have, uh, we could really improve scheduling by using much better power policies. Now, as it turns out, all of these kind of intuitive power assignment policies can be very bad. So they can actually be almost as bad as, uh, as this trivial, simple um, protocol which just assigns every node in one time slot. So they can be highly suboptimal. And later I will show that it can be done much, much better with a much more uh, intricate, much more um, maybe clever power assignment policy. So the results are these. So we have seen that kind of it is trivial to schedule the nodes with a scheduling complexity of n. This is trivial, just one after the other. Now you can show that any protocol that has that uses uniform power assignment policies in the worst case also has a linear number of time slots. So this is basically as bad as the above. And also any protocol that uses a this kind of linear power assignment policy, which is very intuitive, right? But still, it can be as bad as scheduling every node one after the other. Now, I also have to stress that the hidden constants here are actually very small. So this is really almost as bad as, as scheduling one node after the other. Yes, this is just coming now. So what kind of instances are bad? And... Uh, so he has said we are studying worst case examples. So of course, if you study, say, randomly distributed networks, then things will always be good. Right? So, but if you study worst case examples, then for instance, you could have this network in which nodes are kind of placed in an exponentially growing chain. And now I'm drawing this like this, but you still have to keep in mind this is an exponentially growing line here. What you can show is that it is possible to schedule these nodes in a constant number of time slots. This is possible, but sorry? for any alpha, okay. for any alpha, you can draw this. Uh, yeah. this. And the point is that this this hidden constant uh, depends on alpha. Okay. So if you have a large alpha, you can schedule. You have a little bit more parallelism, and if you have a small alpha, you have a little bit less. But because alpha is always a constant between 
say, 2 and 6. Uh, so the result remains. And also for every beta, so just, I mean, for every beta within reasonable bounds, of course, if beta is a function of n, then this would not hold. But this is easy. So, <coughs> so now let's see how many times, how many links can you schedule if you use, for instance, this linear power assignment policy. Let's assume that this node here is the first. So we, we now study one time slot. So let's say this is the first one that is scheduled. And of course, this creates some interference. Now you can show that the interference to all nodes at the left is now, say, rho. This is this constant divided by 2 to the alpha. Now let's say this is the second node that we schedule in the same time slot. And this, again, um, creates interference. And you can compute this, and you will see that the interference to all nodes in the left is now at least 2 times rho divided by 2 to the alpha. And you can go on like this. So say this is the third node that is scheduled. And now the interference is already 3 rho to the over 2 to the alpha. This is because it's an exponential chain. And now what you can see um, is that, let's say you have x nodes that you can schedule in parallel. Now the leftmost receiver has an interference of at least x times rho divided by 2 to the alpha. But it still must be able to decode this message. So you can plug in this signal to noise uh, formula and say it must be at least beta. I'm not going to go into the details of this. This is actually not so difficult. And you can simplify this here. And let's assume just for the sake of this presentation, for simplicity, that we don't have any noise. Uh, in the paper, of course, it's done much more formal. But let's just assume here. We can also cut away this constant rho. And then what we see is that we have that 2 to the alpha over x must be larger than beta. And this means that in any time slot, if we use this power assignment policy, we can have at most 2 to the alpha divided by beta simultaneously transmitting node. And this, of course, means that we have uh, now, in, until we can schedule every, everything, we need to have at least a linear number of times. And again, I stress that it could have been done in a constant number of times, so much, much better. And notice that alpha and beta are small constants, so this is really almost as bad as scheduling one node after the other. So again, here are the results. And what kind of implications and observations can we now gain from them? So first of all, the theoretical worst case performance of all currently used Mac layer protocols, which I'm aware of, which do not really use power assign uh, policies, uh, can be almost as bad as scheduling every single node one after the other. And of course, this has dramatic implications also on the capacity, also on the throughput that can be achieved. Secondly, of course, this implies a severe scaling problem. And third, kind of if we want to have be theoretically efficient Mac layer protocols, we must use highly non-trivial power levels. Otherwise, it's not possible. So the question is, can we do better? Can we have a better power assignment policy? And we have seen that if we use kind of fixed power assignment policies, we cannot do better. Also, if we have, it can be shown that if we have only, say, a small number of different power levels, we cannot really do better. And what we have seen from this simple four-node example is that, say, if we have a kind of graph-based approach, then also we cannot do better. So how can we do better now? And I will just present uh, one slide because, yeah. Sure. Yeah, this is, uh, this is true. And, and uh, so theoretically, if you have such a small number of transmission powers, then you cannot achieve a good performance. Now, for example, I know in, say, sensor nodes, standard sensor nodes, um, these MICA2 sensor nodes, they have a, lo uh, a large number of different um, uh, power levels which they can choose from. I think 200 something. But I'm not sure whether this is really. I guess, I guess my point is that it's sort of a little bit Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, we do because uh, we can really just say if we have a noise. Um, the noise we can just take the max. Of course, the noise will also come into this uh, into this formula. But like what 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 this says is that even if we don't have any noise, but even even in the perfect world. Of course, there is a kind of a, uh, like the first interesting power level must be significantly above the noise, right? But, after, but below, uh, above this, above this, uh, there might be interesting ones, right? I'm not saying you don't have to have infinitely many, but you need to have uh, a large number of different power levels. Yes, of course. So here we really assume that. Um, so in what I'm going to present in the, in the kind of better algorithm or protocol, we have a fixed alpha in mind, and this is actually a very interesting point because uh, if you assume that alphas can kind of change, or, or different links have different alphas, then it's it's much much harder to come up with a good solution. So this is what you can do, of course, is to say. Um, no, this is actually, yeah, this is a very good point, but uh, it's, it's an, it's an ab abstraction in this sense. Yeah. So, I, just in uh, about three slides or so, I will also present like more practical measurements we have done, so to really show that this is actually not only uh, theoretical, say, chimic, but it is actually has an impact in practice. So, um, so as I have said, it can be done much better. Now, the problem is that this protocol, which we, you can use in order to have a to have a provably efficient scheduling, is actually quite intricate because you need to adjust the power levels to kind of uh, tricky values. I will not go into the details of this. I will just say that the intuition is that you must that if you're a node and you have a short link, you must kind of overpower your receiver in order to have a good uh, performance. And otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, so I will leave this uh, out, I think. Now, the problem is, of course, that if, you, if you're a node and you overpower your receiver, then, of course, this will create much more interference to the other nodes. So now you kind of, uh, you, this, this, this uh, um, creates new problems and so on. So uh, the, ba the baseline here is that choosing the the links that you want to schedule and assigning the power assignment is in fact a very a problem that is interrelated and quite intricate. And instead, I will just now present the results. And what we can show is that it is possible even in worst case networks, in every network, that every node can be scheduled in a time that is uh, polylogarithmic in n, so it's log to the 3 in n. And notice that this is of course, exponentially better than um, these kind of Mac layer protocols and scheduling protocols that are used today in the worst case. And in fact, now you can say, okay, this scheduling protocol is really a scheduling problem that we look at. Like every node just sends once. It's like really simple. So, but in fact, you can show that you can do much more efficiently. You can do, for instance, you can schedule in every network, even in a worst case network, you can schedule a strongly connected topology also very efficiently in polylogarithmic time. And of course, this is also better, uh, exponentially better than, than this. Yeah? No. So what I say is that in every network, you give me a network, you place the nodes as you want them to be. And I can give you um, a schedule which, if we combine all the links, comes up with a strongly connected topology. And this schedule has length only polylog polylogarithmic in it. 
Now you can give me a topology that is strongly collected, which may be much harder to schedule. So it's I, I can choose the, the yes, yes. Yes, sure. So this is uh, something which is definitely true. So here is just like a theoretical in the sense that you can show, okay, even this, say, more complex problem is theoretically feasible to do. Now, I'm not saying this is practical in the sense that you can route on this topology. Uh, or like this topology, is, this topology may be not efficient from the point of view of routing or congestion or anything like that. It's just really a to say that like even this more complex problem you can do much, much more efficiently than any current MacLayer protocol can do even this simple problem. In terms of power consumption, it is it depends. Like if you um, so I have done some very initial studies on this. Uh, if you take the sum of all the powers then this protocol is more or less competitive to the optimal. Because the point is that like the bad instances are those in which you have very long links and very short links. So this kind of exponentially growing things. And in our protocol, it is that the very long links, they transmit at almost minimum power. So now if you take the sum, of course, then the, the long links will dominate, even if you overpower the short links. Now, if you take, say, not the sum, but kind of the, if you look at it from a per node basis, so if you say, okay, you're a node and your link is this and this long, so your minimum power is this, but how much power do you need? Then it is, uh, you need to spend much, much more power. And in fact, I believe that there is a, there is a, this is somehow a theorem that can be proved. That if you want to have fast scheduling, you must have a very, uh, somehow, Power assignment must be very unbalanced. So, as I have pointed or as I have mentioned, uh, you know, so far we have done theory in the sense that you know we were motivated by the question of kind of trying to understand what is really possible in wireless networks as opposed to uh, what is currently done in MacLayer protocols. And the theoretician would say, okay. We have seen that in the worst case, standard scheduling policies fail. They can be extremely bad as compared to the optimal. But the theoretician might also say, OK, but we know theoretically it is possible to do much better. So there's good and bad news. And what would the practitioner say? Well, he might say, oops, he might say, OK, I don't really care because, like, why do I need this? Or if he's more, say, polite or theoretically inclined, he might say, okay, how can I use this now for practical application? So in other words, I now raise the topic of how can we now go from theory to practice? How can we put this into practice? So what we have done is we have done measurements. So we have used uh, standard MICA2 sensor nodes. These are very standard uh, sensor nodes. Um, and small devices here on this uh, picture. And we have replaced the standard MacLayer protocol in these devices and, and kind of implemented a tailor-made tailor uh, uh, so-called SINR Mac. So this is just a name I made up. Um, and we have measured, for instance, this uh, scheduling problem. So you, one wants to send to six, two to five, and so on. And when you measure this, so we, we have them, had them set, send 20,000 packets. And when you measure this, you can see that you can like by using proper power assignment policies, you can reach a speed up of almost a factor of three while still almost all packets arrive. So this is comparably good with the standard MacLay. No, uh, so we sent 20,000 packets and, on, and waited until they are sent and then we checked how many of them uh, were received properly or not.
where you just count the number of packets that are received. So we don't have acknowledgement or anything like that. We just no, sorry. Ah, oh, sorry. Oh, this word is wrong. Sorry. 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 Okay. Just. But this word, uh, you just have to. Uh, sorry. This is a mistake on the on the slide. Sure. Um, I was collaborating with uh, someone who wrote the software, so I'm not. Uh, probably I could have done myself too, but uh, it would have taken some time. So my my colleague did it. But it's actually not so difficult. So. Yeah, of course, this topology is, in, is, of course, a good one for us because it's exactly the topology where we can, where we can prove that you can use these uh, things to achieve a better performance. Now, if you have, say, a random deployment topology or if you put them just on a line regularly, then, of course, uh, like you cannot show that what we have studied now can be used. So this is just a topology which highlights that in certain scenarios, like using these power assignment policies can greatly improve the uh, performance. I I think there, yeah, I think there are topologies where, like if you use if you assign powers properly, then this proper power assignment will just be the same power assignment as. <laughs> everyone else uses. So I think in a regular, say in a very uh, a uniformly distributed network, then a kind of a uniform power assignment will be, say, reasonably good. So I don't think that you can really uh, get this kind of speed up. But it's really these extreme cases where you can uh, have a factor of two or three of the speed up. No, it's, in this sense, it's more like a proof of concept. Uh, or maybe it's in between. So what we did is we really uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, built these different deployments and then set the power ranges accordingly. Yeah, the power is the, or the, the protocol discover the no, it's, topology and discover the no, 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 no. We, it's not, so, so that's why I said it's this MAC protocol is in, uh, is in these, right? So it's not a MAC protocol. In this sense, this comparison is not fair, right? Did because did, this is. Did it human set our um, we yes yes okay. basically okay. yeah yeah. However, I, one thing I want to mention is that it's quite robust in the sense that you know it's not like up to a millimeter, and then if you move it to one millimeter, it's it's, it's gone, right? So we set the powers, and then you can really move right. them around well, a little bit. No, it's it's far. It's very far. So it's proof of concept is a better word. Oh, this is uh, I don't know. It's just we like this is practical. So I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, we we computed with a uh, we computed with a value of I don't know two point five or so. We just put it and then it worked. So it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. It's it's very easy, and, and in fact, turns out that these formulas and the real, unless you put like walls in between, then it becomes a different game. But like if you put them here, and it's quite it's quite amazing how close the formulas and reality kind of correspond. So I was kind of surprised uh, that these kind of things really work. You know. So. It came from a theoretical point of view, and I said, okay, theoretically, this is possible. But I thought, in no way this is possible. And you really have to remove this standard MAC protocol because, you know, if you have 802.11 or so, this won't work because you have this RTS and CTS, and they won't do this. But if you then replace it and, and compute the powers and put them in such a way, then it works. So it's, that was quite amazing.
So I really have to stress this, you know, that this is not, we don't really have yet a, say, a protocol which you can really implement on the nodes and then they will compute these things. And so we're not this far yet. Right? So we didn't we didn't do this. I suppose that if you build a, a say a simple uh, topology, then the speed up will be very small. So it's really these cases which make uh, which gives you this. Uh, this speed. Yeah. Well, I just think that uh, it's kind of. <coughs> But first of all, like this is just to say that kind of the, the theoretical things we have seen, they work in practice. Right. So now what kind, of thing, what, what kind of situations can this be used? Well, I don't know. So I'm not so sure whether, for example, such a case is such unrealistic in a real network. So I'm not so sure whether, so personally I believe that the randomly deployed network, a randomly <laughs> uniformly distributed network, is much, much more unlikely to exist in reality than this one. Because you know where you deploy nodes is, for instance, in a, in a hallway or so. And then why not that U1 wants to transmit to U6? Like, why not? So I personally, I don't think this is so extremely far away from a practical scenario. But again, I have to stress is that this is the main purpose of this uh, experiment is just to show that it works in practice. And now the, the effort has to go to really implement a MAC protocol which kind of makes use of these ideas. Now, I don't know which one was first. This is a very interesting question. Uh, I, I think that you might be able to derive, say, from the topology of the network, you might be able to derive some kind of guess how much you could improve. So this is my intuition, but I haven't, we have not go into this. Uh, but this is a very interesting question. <coughs> yeah, okay, you can. I mean, what you if you know the standard MAC protocol, how it works, right? Then you can, of course. You can uh, maybe compute kind of what kind of, uh, like, well, a simple thing would be, okay, like a factor of three is kind of easy to compute, right, theoretically, because you say it, it, the standard MAC protocol will never um, uh, kind of schedule these links in parallel, right? But we always do it. So basically, roughly a factor of three, what you can get with a back of the envelope. So this is a good point that I'm going to talk about just in a minute. Oh, great. The next part <laughs> <laughs> so let me give you two possible applications. Now, again, I have to stress that we did not do this in practice, but it's just a possible application. So consider, for instance, a, um, a channel consisting of wireless nodes. So you have wireless nodes, and this is the channel. So the source node to the left wants to transmit as much information as possible to the right using multi-hop channels. So what you can do is the following. This red node injects a packet, and this is then moved on one hop, and it is again moved on by, hop, uh, moved on by one hop. And it is now in the fourth time slot that the source can inject a new packet, because here it cannot because you know, there is uh, interference. So now in the fourth time slot, the source can inject a new packet, and so on. And what you can see is that the the rate you can achieve, the capacity you can achieve is, say, one-third, because the source can inject a new packet in every time slot, uh, one out of three. So you can improve this. Say a source can uh, use a three, can transmit its message to a three-hop neighbor that has a higher transmission range. Then you can do this. And then in the third time slot, say this um, a source can inject a new packet, but it cannot inject it to here, but only to here, because again, this would interfere with this. 
So you can do a somewhat more uh, complicated uh, strategy here, and what you will see is that you can inject three packets in out of seven, out of seven time slots. So this is better, but it's still below one half. And in fact, it is. Uh, it can be shown that kind of any this kind of I say they call it graph-based strategy. Uh, so or none of these say graph-based strategies can achieve a rate of one half. So they're all worse. But for certain alpha and beta, we can do the following. We can now do, okay, the source injects a packet, and then already in the next time slot, it can already inject a new packet by kind of overhopping the other packet. And then they overhop again each other, and so on. And it is now in the fifth time slot that we, the source can inject a new packet, and so on. So what you see here is that for certain alpha and beta, it is kind of possible, theoretically possible, to have a capacity of one half, because here, um, or a rate of one half, because in, out of four time slots, the source injects a package in two time slots. So you can read, you can, using this kind of explicit power assignment schemes, you can potentially reach a better uh, rate in such a in such a channel. Case. And now I'm coming to uh, the slide which he already proposed. Um, this hetero heterogeneous uh, networks. So, uh, so one important application of sensor networks is data gathering. This is a crucial thing. And so we have this network here, and they need to transport, say, events or uh, data to the base station. And now, what in this network, nodes, kind of neighboring nodes, always have to communicate with each other from time to time. Because maybe they need to synchronize their time, or they need to detect new neighbors, and so on. So kind of all the time, neighboring nodes have to talk to each other. But now let's say there is an important event coming that has to be reported to the base station as quickly as possible. So say we are here in Seattle, so there may be a grizzly coming. So this sensor node here has to detect this grizzly and transmit to the base station as, po as quickly as possible. And for this, it might want to use long hops, long range hops, so that the delay is short. Now, Potentially, again, using these explicit power assignment schemes, potentially it is possible to, for these long hop links and these short hop links to coexist, right? In the sense that you don't have to co coordinate the short hops in order to do the long hop. And the same is holds with, say, if you have a heterogeneous network with, like, uh, nodes that have uh, larger sending power than others and so on. So this is just another possible application. But now with this, I would like to move on to the second part of my talk now. Um, and this is about some peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks and internet. So what is the idea? Um, well, in a network like the internet, we can kind of uh, say that we can kind of have three uh, different kinds of players in, in such a network. So we have those which are kind of nice and good and benevolent and so on. And we have those which are maybe selfish and rational. So those are the kind of free riders. They just want to download but not <coughs> upload. And, of course, we have those which are really bad, those which really want to destroy the system or attack the system. And, so and sorry? And of course, what has been studied a lot is the kind of the various um, the various relationships between these kind of groups. But what is actually the impact of malicious or Byzantine kind of players on a system which consists of selfish or rational um, players? Now, let me explain this just once more. So, say a, tra a traditional malicious attack consists of a system where you have a kind of good people and they work together, but now some people are bad and they attack the system. And the idea of, say, distributed computing, cryptography, security, and so on, is how to defend against such attacks or how many such bad guys you can uh, tolerate and so on. But if you have, a inter if you have for example, the internet or P2P networks or electronic markets and so on, you can kind of, the, the participants in these networks are kind of not... Uh, nice, but they are selfish, right? And so the question is now, what is the impact of 
bad guys to such a system? How, how tolerant is, is such a system consisting of selfish people against uh, Byzantine and malicious attacks? So far, I'm only aware of kind of one uh, previous work that deals explicitly with this topic. It's a, more like a, a system paper published last year. But we want to take a more of a theoretical approach in the sense that I really want to um, kind of quantify the impact of malicious players on a selfish system. Now, in the next three or so slides, I would like to um, introduce some uh, definitions and things that we're going to use. So, first of all, if you have a system, and if everyone perfectly collaborated with each other, then the, the solution that comes out is kind of the social optimum, in the sense that this is the, the thing that is for everyone is the best. Right? So the social optimum is the solution which is formed by perfectly collaborating players. Now a player, you know, if you're talking about peer-to-peer -peer system, this a player is a peer or it can be a host or an agent or whatever. So let's just call them players at the moment. So now, if we want to study what is the impact of selfish behavior on such a system, then we need to uh, use the concept of, say, Nash equilibrium or the price of anarchy. And this is um, on the cell in the next slide. Now, the goal of a selfish player is to reduce its own cost or to, to kind of to download as much as possible without uploading, right? Or to maximize its benefit or utility. And the term of a Nash equilibrium now describes somehow a stable point. So if, if everyone is selfish and you have a situation in which no one can improve its situation, so everyone is kind of stays with the, the, the action that he's currently doing, then this, this uh, situation is stable and this is called a Nash equilibrium. And now the price of anarchy is now the ratio which describes, okay, how much better is the social optimum as opposed to the Nash equilibrium. So in other words, I will make all of this very intuitive. So they're all, uh, all of these things are defined formally. I will just make it intuitive. So the price of anarchy does captures exactly what it says. It, it captures how much, or what is the degradation of the system performance if people act selfishly as opposed to if they perfectly collaborate. And of course, uh, when it comes to the system, if it has a high price of anarchy, then you may want to use some kind of incentives or payments or taxes in order to force the people to behave in a more, uh, in, in a nicer way. And if a, a system has a low price of anarchy, then you can say, okay, we don't care because even if everyone is selfish, the outcome will be reasonably okay. Okay, so, but now, what is the impact of Byzantine players? So, um, what we have done is we have defined the notion of a so-called Byzantine Nash equilibrium, and this is actually simple, because a Byzantine Nash equilibrium describes a situation in which, so now we have Byzantine players, and they want to dis deteriorate the social welfare. That's their goal. So selfish players want to optimize their own benefit, but Byzantine players, their goal is to deteriorate the social wealth, to minimize social wealth. So a Byzantine Nash equilibrium is a situation in which no selfish player can improve its perceived cost by changing its strategy. Now I stress the word perceived here. I will not go into the detail of this, but from a modeling perspective, this is problematic because, you know, what is selfish depends on what I know. Because if I don't know about other people, then I don't know what is actually good for me to do, so I cannot really be selfish. So I will come back to this in a minute. And now, using now this is the last slide with definitions. Using this definition, we can now define what is called the price of Byzantine anarchy. This is anal uh, uh, the same as the price of anarchy, but now with a number of malicious players. And finally, we can define the so-called price of malice. Malice comes from malicious. Um, and this is now the ratio between the worst case Nash equilibrium with bad guys as opposed to the worst case Nash equilibrium without bad guys. And this price of malice um, 
describes, okay, how much can a system, or how much does the, the, um, the existence of bad guys in a system deteriorate the system performance? No, no, no. So this is the social welfare is defined as. Yeah, but so what we have done is the social welfare is somewhat defined as the sum of all the selfish players' welfare because we say okay, if someone is bad. <laughs> Is it selfish in the sense that it wants to deteriorate? Yes, yes. So it, yes. So from a, so from a, like, from a formal point of view, a Byzantine player is also a selfish player. And from a semantic point of view, this is a different thing, right? So this is a, somehow. You could you could you could say like this, yes. So, the good ones, benevolent ones. In a way, and so it, I mean, otherwise, otherwise, it really does evolve to a system where every player is allowed to have a full company and every variable system, and every player might want the system to have some arbitrary difference. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so, so that's what I said. Like, if you, from a say, really game theoretic point of view, there is not really so we, we have not really defined a, a distinction between a selfish player and a Byzantine player from a, but so. These definitions will become more clear once I, I tell you which kind of system we have actually studied with it. It's really more like a semantic distinction. Some people want to optimize their own benefit and others do not, right? They want to deteriorate the system. Then, so when considering a specific game or a specific uh, system, then the, the notion of um, Byzantine versus selfish will become more, more clear. No, so what, what we do, uh, as you will see, so, so um, it is true, of course. Like in certain systems, um, if the Byzantine player has a, a, is able to invest, say, as much money as he wants to, then, then the system goes down you know, rapidly. Now, in, in the game we are going to study, is, uh, it is not the case. So um, it will not turn out. But of course, in a general uh, game or in a general situation, it could be could be like this. So, okay, so we have defined this price of malice, and notice that in a system, this price of anarchy and this price of malice are somehow orthogonal. So, a system can have a high price of anarchy but a low price of malice, and so. so okay, what we have studied is a very simple. So we have tried to find an, an or we we have studied a very simple. Um, game, and now this definition might become more clear here, why we defined it as this. Um, so we want you to understand this kind of virus uh, 
spread of virus in a network, we modeled the network for simplicity as a grid. And you know, every node can choose whether or not to install antivirus software. If you install the software, this costs you one unit, this costs you some time or some money and effort, and you know, many people are kind of lazy to install this, and so on. But once you have installed it, you're safe. And in the end, now we let say we, we model this virus as say in the end there was, will be one node randomly chosen will be attacked by this virus, and then every node that is in this uh, same connected insecure component will be attacked by the virus. And once you're attacked by the virus, this costs you L, and L is larger than 1. So, so in a sense, you have a trade-off, right? The selfish player has a trade-off. You know, either it can install the antivirus software, this costs him some time and some effort, but then it is safe, or it can say, okay, the risk of me being hit is so small, I would just hope and, and see what happens. Now, it can be shown that this, uh, you know, you can show tight... Uh, bounds for the price of anarchy here, but is now what, what we have now studied is the impact of malicious agents in the system. So now let us add, say, B bits and T nodes to this grid. So let's say some of these nodes are kind of bad in the sense that they kind of pretend to have installed the antivirus software, but in fact they didn't. Right? So they're kind of uh, not playing according to the rules. And so now what happens here? So let's say, again, we have the same virus, but because of this guy there being a bad guy, um, also these nodes here will be attacked. And now we can ask, okay, what is the price of malice in the system? And the answer is, uh, it depends on what the nodes know about the system. So this is what I've hinted at before a little bit. So it depends on whether we... So we, we have studied two models, an oblivious model and a non-oblivious model. In the oblivious model, say a node does not know about the existence of bad guys in the system. So every node thinks everyone else is also selfish and everyone else is, you know. So a node does not know about the existence of bad guys in the system. And for this model, we can compute tight pounds for the price of bits and anarchy and the price of malice. And what can be sh said here about these results is that the price of malice grows quadratically in B and also, this does not come out of this formula, but it can be shown that the price of malice is always at least 1, which just says that, it's somewhat the intuitive fact, that if you have a system consisting of selfish players, then if you add some bad guys to the system, then the social welfare cannot increase by adding bad guys to a system. This is No, in this... They don't even know. So this is, so in, in this oblivious case, they don't know. And in this sense, it is clear that adding malicious players cannot improve social value. Yeah? Yes, so this is what we assume. Yes. Yes. Because then, because then the risk of you exactly you being hit by the virus, kind of being the first, is very. Right. So of course. Is there only your neighbors you know about? No. We, in this model, we assume that you know everything. So you know global knowledge, which of course is somehow highly unrealistic, but it's it's just a model. So this is uh, certainly. So, but now let's, we have also studied this non-oblivious case, and this non-oblivious case, this is the model um, that was just proposed before, this is the case in which um, the selfish players know about the existence of malicious players, and they know how many there are, but they don't know where they are. Right? So they know, okay, um, in the system, say, 20% of, of the people may be bad guys, but I don't know where they are looking. And... So what we have assumed is a kind of risk-averse model, and we have computed the Byzantine anarchy and the price of malice. And what can be seen here is that um, the price of malice grows linearly in B. I have to say we only have lower bounds, but we 
conjecture that this is uh, asymptotically tight. So it can be seen that um, the price of malice grows linearly in B. And what is interesting, however, that the price of malice can become less than 1. And now what does this mean? This means that if you have a system of selfish people and they know about other people being bad, then this can actually improve the social welfare. Also adding bad people to this uh, system can actually improve the social welfare. So the reason is that now the selfish players will become more willing to cooperate. Now, this is something which, is, can, which can easily be seen in other fields, actually. So in politics, for instance, so if you have a bunch of selfish people and you want them to cooperate, you can give them a common enemy somehow, and then they will be more willing to cooperate. Now, the interesting thing, however, is that this improved cooperation in our game, in this improved cooperation can actually outweigh the, the effect of the malicious attack itself. So in other words, putting it very simply, uh, in, in these certain cases, everyone is better off if they are malicious players and, and the selfish players know that. So we have, they have defined the so-called fear factor, and this is the inverse of the price of malice, and it just describes the possible achievable performance gain when introducing B bits and team players to the system. And we were able to upper bound this fear factor by a constant. So we can say that in this um, network model, um, adding bad guys can potentially improve the system, but it cannot improve it beyond certain Okay, so this concludes my, the second part of my talk. Um, we have seen this price of malice is orthogonal to the price of anarchy, and this, of course, allows you to put the system depending on these uh, two values. Now, as I have already uh, pointed out, I would like to spend the last one or two minutes to give you a brief overview over some of my other research um, uh, projects. So first, we have seen the scheduling in wireless networks. We have another work um, uh, in this area here. Then I have done some works about uh, P2P networks and uh, <coughs> algorithms for internet, for the, for the internet. So some of them published at POTC, uh, which is a theory conference in distributed computing. Then I have done some work in sensor networks, mainly focusing about the as I believe, practically important aspect of initialization of such sensor networks, also clustering. Some of these are more theoretical, others are more practical. Then some work has been about more theory. Uh, in particular here, we have studied um, distributed approximation, and in particular the hardness of distributed approximation. And finally, and this is maybe what I'm also very proud of, is that some of my work kind of, or was I was trying that some of my work kind of bridges the gap between theory and practice in the sense that it kind of derives from, theoretical, from a theoretical approach that really tries to um, say something about practical problems or, or kind of deliver results which have an impact in practice. And with this overview, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm now ready to take some more questions um, if you have them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much.